I'd like to call order to the uh, meeting. Today is a standing committee, committee meeting on community services. Uh, I'm MLA Melissa Sheehy Richard, and I'll be chairing the meeting today. Just a, remind, a couple of reminders before we get into things is that to keep, please keep your max, mask on except for when you're speaking. Um, and also wait for me to acknowledge uh, you before you speak so that Ledge TV can get the mics on. And I understand we'll be sharing uh, Mr. Richard's mic in the corner there for the, the people, folks in the back. Um, please, as a reminder, to, um, to put your phones and devices on silent. And I'll take it, uh, we'll introduce, uh, beginning on my left, MLA White. Awesome, we start the best. <laughs> John White, MLA for Glace Bay and Dominion. Good morning, thank you for coming. Danielle Barcos, Chester St. Margaret's. Hi there, uh, Tom Taggart, uh, Colchester North. Good morning everyone, Nolan Young, MLA for Shelburne County. Good morning everyone, Susie Hansen for Halifax Needham. Good morning, thank you for being here. Kendra Coombs, Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Hi, good morning everyone, Derek Mumberkett, MLA City Member 2. Good morning, Fred Tilly, MLA Northside Westmount. And I will begin with our witnesses with Mr. Uh, Mayich, please. Hi, John Mayich, Director of Student Affairs at Cape Breton University. And uh, Mr. McIntyre. Uh, Kent McIntyre, Special uh, Projects Manager for CBU and President of Urban Neighborhood Development Association. Mr. Luker. Hi, I'm Sean Luker, Director with Cape Breton Island Housing Authority. Deputy uh, Minister LaFleche. Paul LaFleche, the Deputy Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Mr. Richard. Good morning, everyone. Stefan Richard, Executive Director, Housing Solutions and Development for the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And maybe quickly, I'll just for the record introduce that uh, we have Stephen McIsaac, Chief Executive Officer, Housing Authorities, as well. We And we have Tech. Tatiana Morin, uh, Frazier, Executive Director, Housing Strategy and Transformation. Uh, and we also have Stephen Hines, Program Manager for Housing Services in, in the Eastern Region. I also like to acknowledge the uh, Ledge, or excuse me, Executive Council, uh, Ms. Kinley, and the clerk as well. Um, so on today's agenda, we have the officials, as I said, with us from Cape Breton Island Housing Authority, Cape Breton University, and the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing to discuss housing options for Cape Breton. Um, welcome to all the witnesses for being here today, and uh, we can at this point do presentations, and we will begin with opening remarks from Deputy Minister LaFleche. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting us here to speak with you today about housing options for Cape Breton. Um, I was introduced as Deputy Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and also Seniors in Long-Term Care. And I'd just like to reiterate the staff here today. Stefan Richard is Executive Director, uh, Housing Solutions and Development, but really that's housing programs for the non-public housing component. In other words, people who are not in public housing seniors who own their own houses, et cetera, et cetera. Stephen McIsaac is the CEO of Housing Nova Scotia, so that would be the person responsible for public housing. Um, he is also the supervisor of, uh, Stephen McIsaac is the supervisor of, just looking who's here, Sean Luker, who's here, who's a director, reporting through Ed Lake to Stephen. Um, so Sean is also a witness for us, as well as a witness for you. So I may toss questions to Sean, because he works for us, okay? It's a bit confusing. I think it got confused in the invite. Um, Tatiana Morin Fraser is an Executive Director, Transformation Strategic Initiatives, and uh, she's basically the, the, the Policy Director for Housing that uh, works on um, the programming, again, for we're across both right now, public housing and non-public housing. And Stephen Hines is our program manager that reports to... Uh, um, Neil uh, McDonald. Who? Neil McDonald. Who reports to you? Okay. <laughs> we won't get into the chain, okay? <laughs> There's a lot of chains. We'll work on that, okay? Um, the Auditor General may have some words to say about that on June 21st. Um, we got what we got when we inherited it, and we got to fix it. So Stephen Hines, our program manager, in the eastern region, which includes Cape <laughs> Breton, um, and uh, I spoke about Sean. So, Madam Chair, we know there's a housing crisis 
It's impacting a lot of people across this province. Rents are increasing, uh, although uh, hopefully not more than the 2% cap right now. And uh, so is the cost of real estate. And of course, there's all sorts of other costs going up, uh, which uh, involve essentials as well as non-essential things that people buy. There are a number of factors driving this, and unfortunately, there's no one solution. We're working with private and non-profit partners on a number of fronts in order to address Nova Scotia's diverse housing needs. Uh, last October, government released a comprehensive housing plan to increase housing supply and also support those experiencing homelessness in partnership with my colleague, uh, colleagues at Community Services. Last, uh, it announced 35 million investments for over 1,100 affordable housing units, including an additional 425 rent supplements. Uh, all of the components of that 35 million have not yet been announced because some are in negotiation with Ottawa or other areas, but all of it will, will be, uh, be spent. In the recent budget, government added another 550 additional rent supplements, uh, and these are available to provide flexible and affordable housing options mm -hmm. to over 5,000 rent supplements <coughs> in total every month that we have. So that's about uh, one third of the total support if you include that we have uh, somewhere just under 12,000 public housing units. So about one third of the total support would be rent supplements. Uh, rent supplements are an important part of our approach because they allow flexibility to people who need it, as well as public housing is an important part of our approach. They allow stability to those who would like stability. We can offer rent supplements anywhere across the province. They're very flexible, and we offer them to the people most in need based on established criteria. They're available immediately, and they help reduce the gap between market rent and what people can afford. That's obviously only one piece of the puzzle. We are also working with private and nonprofit partners to provide more affordable housing. We've worked with private partners to provide affordable units at 60 to 80 percent of average market rent. In recent weeks, we've announced 20 year agreements for affordable housing units in Halifax, Lance, Kentville, and Dartmouth, and there are more under negotiation uh, with the federal government uh, which have not yet been announced. We're also working with nonprofit partners to provide more deeply affordable housing that's tailored to the needs of the communities they serve. Along with community services, we were successful in levering a lot of federal funding under the Rapid Housing Initiative to meet the housing needs of our most vulnerable citizens. This includes an important project by the Cape Breton Housing Association. Through the Community Housing Capacity Building Program, we provided $150,000 in seed funding to the Urban Neighborhood Development Association a nonprofit organization that is working in profit with my partners here at CBU on a multi-phase development on the former Tartan Dan's land. As you know, uh, that land was bought by CBU and they, we've met with them uh, to talk about uh, possible affordable housing developments there and uh, maybe even a development that uh, Mr. Tilly in his former job would have liked to know about. Um, but we'll leave that for a later day, right guys? <laughs> it's in the early stages. First they got to build their, uh, their campus. Okay, without, without, without Fred Tilly there, I'm not sure it'll be done quick enough. Right, Fred? Yes. So um, the development will have upwards of 430 residential units with 240 of them. That's over half designated as affordable units. We are actively working to strengthen the nonprofit community housing sector. We recognize that it is hard for nonprofits to do the kind of basic upfront planning and solicit the upfront capital required to create affordable housing. And this is a key point. Uh, it's not the situation you find in Ontario or BC or Alberta where the nonprofit sector, because of the different markets, because they've experienced what we've just started to experience in the last few years, they've experienced it for 40 years. They have a much stronger nonprofit market. And we want to develop that market. We want we, we believe in the profit sector, but we believe a mix is good in the nonprofit sector as well as the public sector. All of those are part of the solution. We must strengthen the nonprofit sector here, though, uh, to allow it to compete. Uh, so we've offered capacity building grants to nonprofit groups across the province, including the Cape Breton Community Housing Association and also New Dawn. We're constantly in discussions with New Dawn on uh, on affordable housing. 
We've created a 2.5 million community housing growth fund to help organizations across the province plan for growth, build capacity, research and come up with innovative new ideas. <coughs> Funds will support the creation of a new provincial nonprofit housing association which will chan champion change and transformation in this emerging sector in Nova Scotia. We also have our 3,308 public housing units in Cape Breton. So approximately 30% of all of the public housing in Nova Scotia is in Cape Breton for about 11% of the population. That's not a, a criticism, that's just a fact, and there are probably very good reasons for it, but I wanted to emphasize that there's a lot of public housing in Cape Breton as a percentage of what we have. I know that Sean Luker will speak to that in detail. Um, we also provide assistance to low-income Nova Scotians in repairing their homes. We ha recently had uh, a meeting, I think it was of the Economic Committee, was it? I've been to so many committees, it's <laughs> blurring in my head. It was either public <laughs> accounts or economic. Econ it was public accounts? Okay, and, and uh, um, uh, Richard, uh, Stefan Richard and I were there to talk about the home repair programs for seniors. Very critical uh, component. We're always looking for ways to help support Nova Scotians. We're lo always looking for new ideas. On the weekend, you may have read an article in the media, the popular media, about the things that wouldn't be helpful in housing. So that's, and then and nowhere in the article did they mention what would be helpful. They just wanted to make sure we knew what wasn't gonna be helpful. So uh, that's not a great approach in my mind. What we need to do is look what's helpful. We need to charge, we, we need to have a multi-pronged approach. We need to hit all areas of the spectrum. There's no one answer, no one size fits all. So that's why we have a very diverse array of programming across the spectrum, and we're approaching it from the public side, the community nonprofit side, and the private side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Minister LaFleche. And uh, now we have a presentation that we will have from uh, Mr. Mayich. Will you put the slides up or do you want, we can, oh, it's, already up. it's up there, yeah. yeah, but it's not on the screen. No. Oh, okay. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry, folks. If we don't have the slides, we can cover it. <laughs> I have the mouse here. I'm just going to call a uh, couple minutes recess. Sorry, folks. Oh, this is not going to take that long. It's <laughs> okay, order. So we have the uh, presentation on our screen, so I'll let you take it from here, Mr. Mayich. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll just have a quick discussion on some of the um, exciting developments that have been happening at Cape Breton University over the past probably five years. Um, for those from uh, Cape Breton um, offices, you'd understand the impact that the university has had in the community. For others, just quickly discuss, we've had a steady um, international enrollment growth between 2008 and 2017. Uh, our markets were primarily China and then the Saudi Arabia cohort. Um, in 2018, we started to see a, a extreme growth from India. We went from about 75 students to a little over 2,500 in a period of three years. The uh, COVID-19 has certainly had an impact on our enrollment the past two years. However, we expect a fully um, enrolled campus of about 6,000 students this coming September with a makeup of about 3,500 international students. If you think back to about 10, 12 years ago, the entire campus was about 3,500 students. So um, that international population has really changed the uh, community. It's also a very non-traditional demographic of student. They're coming at an older age. The average age of our students is 26, and they're coming with families and um, seeking employment. They want to be connected into the communities. They're not looking for that residential campus experience as many younger students would be. So it's required very innovative <coughs> solutions for the university and connecting with the community. Um, we've expanded our classes into the Cineplex location in downtown Sydney. We have a new office location uh, just next door. We've made investments ourselves from the university in purchasing buses. Um, Transit Cape Breton has grown 
exponentially from the size of, uh, I think they had uh, 25 buses and now they're up to 39 over a short period of time, uh, 28 drivers to 50 drivers. So it's had a, a very positive impact and ripple effect. Um, there's also very many positive infrastructure projects occurring around the CBRM and across Cape Breton with hospital development, school development, uh, sporting infrastructure. So um, it's a real exciting time. The NSCC campus, we just took a drive by yesterday. That's coming along quite nicely. Um, and that's going to have a dramatic impact on the community as well. I'm going to hand it over to Kent McIntyre now, the um, president of the Urban Neighborhood Development Association, to talk a bit more about the excitement with Tartan Downs and what that development will look like. Mr. McIntyre. Thank you. So uh, Tartan Downs um, essentially is a former uh, horse racing track. Uh, it's 24 acres. It is in the Ashby area of Sydney, uh, central Sydney, and uh, it is uh, surrounded by a residential neighborhood on three sides and a commercial uh, entity on the, and you can see on the top right hand of that diagram, there would be liquor stores, grocery stores, restaurants in that commercial side. So it's nicely located with lots of amenities around it, but it'll essentially be a smaller neighborhood within a larger neighborhood. Um, we are a registered nonprofit who's partnered with Cape Breton University. So it's the Urban Neighborhood Development Association. It's, and it's short for UNDA, U-N-D-A. And so UNDA has secured seed funding uh, from CMHC and from Nova Scotia Housing. That's 150,000 from Nova Scotia Housing, uh, 100,000 from CMHC. That, those funds have, for the last year and a half, been securing engineering services, architectural services, um, urban planning services, to the point that we have uh, just about completed the design and we're currently and should be finishing either later this week uh, or sooner uh, the cost analysis for the entire project. It's a phased project over four, possibly five years, and uh, there will be 430 residential units. And as Mr. LaFleche has said, there will be 240. Uh, which will be affordable units and he is correct that the affordable units will be 60 to 80 percent of the average median market rent uh, so they'll be quite affordable for that local market um, the uh, um, uh, the under organization will manage the project and eventually the lands will be transferred to under and it'll be managed there'll be staff because of the magnitude of the the project there will be a residential uh, superintendent, maintenance people. I mean, when we have 430 units, they must be maintained and, and looked after. It's quite an investment. Um, and the next slide will show you what the, uh, uh, the architects and the urban planners have essentially creating a neighborhood, but using the theme of it being a former racetrack. Um, so you can see a network of streets. Um, the orange is townhouses and stacked townhouses. The red buildings are apartment buildings, and the blue building is a community inclusion building. It'll be a two-story. Uh, we're, we're going to do a public uh, uh, session in the next three to four weeks and get some ideas from the general public of what they would like to see in that building. Um, there's lots of green spacing and park spacing. You can see on the, uh, on the left-hand side, the green spacing is a little greener than on the the, uh, the right-hand side, that's because that lighter green spacing is elevated uh, green spacing. There'll be parking underneath. It's not underground parking, it's elevated green spacing, uh, which is quite unique. Uh, and when we've shown uh, some of the more details to other groups, they were quite impressed with the idea that it really creates a unique neighborhood setting. And it's not cookie cutter, just a bunch of apartment buildings. We really are creating a workable neighborhood uh, the urban planners were very, uh, very specific in their planning in that uh, they had done a fair amount of, of testing in other markets that most tenants prefer to have a door on the street uh, when it comes to these type of units. And so having a magnitude of townhouses within a development, it will be quite significant. And then here's a rendering of this will be the first phase. It will be townhouses and two apartment buildings. Can I go back uh, to that other? Okay. 
So on the left-hand side, you see the green spacing with the orange loop of townhouses and the two apartment buildings. Well, that's what that rendering shows you on the next page. That is phase one. And that will be 130 <laughs> units uh, in that space. And uh, we are just, as I say, once we finish our cost analysis, we will be able to complete the applications for CMHC and finish off some meetings with, uh, with Mr. LaFleche and his team. And uh, we anticipate starting either late fall or early spring. Um, be nice if we could start late fall, but uh, um, we'll see. By the time we get construction drawings and costing and materials, um, it, it, uh, it may be early spring, but we're really pushing to try and have something started late fall. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Um, we have one final presentation on PowerPoint, uh, Cape Breton Island Housing Authority, um, Mr. Luker. That's the right presentation I have. Right. It's just a matter of making sure that one's down, and then this one can start. Thank you, sir. Thank you. As uh, previously stated, my name is Sean Luker. I'm the director with Cape Breton Island Housing Authority. I'm just giving a public housing overview for my first set. So we're a provincially owned public housing uh, agency. Uh, we're a not-for-profit. Um, and we're the property manager of uh, the public housing portfolio in Cape Breton. Uh, eligibility for our programs is based upon income and also for anyone to live with us, their rent is based on income as well. So we do a rent to geared income model for our public housing there. Um, our wait list after applicants apply with us, they're chronological. And we do have a priority access uh, option as well, which would forego the chronological wait list. That's, uh, it covers three categories. It's when you're um, escaping any type of violence or abuse, or you need to gain access uh, to closer locations to hospitals for life-sustaining medical supports, or if you're living in an unsafe or risky uh, housing environment, you could apply for priority access, which would forego the chronological wait list. The uh, Cape Breton, oh, sorry. Oh, you want me to do that? No, that's good, thank you. So we're, I'm sorry, I went to the slide that I just spoke about. <laughs> All right, so um, our housing context, we have, uh, in Cape Breton alone, uh, there's 57,515 households, 14,000 plus of those are renters, 42,000 plus are homeowners. And, <coughs> So 13.5, sorry, 13.4% of CBRM households are in core housing need. And uh, core housing need is uh, you, you're basically paying 30 plus 30% uh, more. So 30% is the CMHC benchmark for when you need to live. It's core housing needs means you are exceeding those benchmarks. Um, and 6% of homeowners, sorry, I apologize. Uh, so out of the core housing needs, 32% are renters, 6% are homeowners. And our median household income uh, is $53,862 and $66,000 for homeowners, $28,000 for renters. So public housing units and tenants, uh, we hold 13.6% of the provincial population in Cape Breton. Uh, 984 of our, our buildings are public housing. Uh, we're 37% of the provincial total for buildings. Uh, and for public housing, like Deputy LaFleche said, we have 3,308 units, which is 29% of the provincial total of units. Um, so out of that, we have uh, 5,707 people living with us in public housing. 64% of those are seniors. 31% are families, and then 5% are non-elderly singles. Non-elderly singles are, are, are just uh, individuals 
that don't have dependents that are under the age of 58. Uh, Cape Breton average annual income is $18,300 and an average rent is $459 a month. Okay, so what we do for renewal on public housing is we we focus on investment and preservation and uh, renewal of our current portfolio. So for instance, last year, we had $3.84 million invested to our renewal of our existing portfolio, our portfolio and that's 78 projects that it supports. And this upcoming year, we have $7 million in capital investments to complete 56 projects. And one of those projects, significant, is coming up on the next slide after here. Um, we have a continued uh, accessibility for the last three years. So in 2019 to 22, we've uh, been investing $2.15 million into accessibility, which impacted 27 units, made six of those barrier free and 21 of those near accessible. And then this upcoming year, we're uh, starting a pilot for a green retrofit project. It's $8 million over the next four years to upgrade uh, 220 plus units. Uh, those are majority family units, and that would cover uh, almost half our portfolio there for our family. Uh, so the target here is to reduce our energy consumption by 50% and uh, and operating and maintenance costs should reduce and our greenhouse gases should uh, re reduce with this project as well. Um, and we, it should help to create maintenance work, uh, jobs in our rural areas as well uh, for upkeep. And our pilot will be assessed on implementation across the rest of the province. So once we uh, start off in Cape Breton, it, it sh it's gonna be applied to the rest of the public housing in Nova Scotia. Thanks very much. Great, thank you for that. Um, we will now move into um, questioning. We will do it in intervals of 20 minutes per caucus, and we can begin that with the Liberal Caucus. Um, Mr. Tilly. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, committee, our witnesses for great presentations. Very much appreciate. Um, those those uh, those thoughts and uh, kind of caused a couple of questions that that I would have. So the first question I would have is probably for Deputy Lafleche uh, around the housing grant for low income uh, housing to uh, help seniors stay in their homes longer. So what we've found is that there's uh, an income discrepancy within within the province. So if you live in CBRM. The threshold is 27.5. If you live in Victoria, it's 49 or somewhere along those. Um, in the fall, I had asked a question around that, and uh, the answer was that it was recognized and there was some work being done on it, and it was an active file. So, just wonder if we have an update on how, uh, because right now many seniors are just over, so that limit I think is 29,000 somewhere around there, 27 or 29, and they're just over that with their just getting CPP and EI. If you have two in the family, they're just over. So just wondering if there's an update on that program. Deputy so, uh, Minister LaFleche. Yeah. Sorry, I got to wait for that. Q. <laughs> <laughs> I am, uh, if Kim Langella here, she'd tell you I am the most badly behaved in terms of microphone decorum um, that you'll ever see. So um, I'm going to start speaking to that, and then I'll, send it, I'll hand it over to Stefan. So we have recognized uh, those issues. Minister Lohr recognized them early on when he came in. He was quite surprised that these things existed. But the biggest thing he was most concerned about immediately uh, was the, uh, what are they called, intra-county issues. So where you, the counties actually had different sides of the street had a different thing. One side of the street was tens of thousands different from the other side of the street with identical looking housing. So uh, we've moved to solve those first. We can solve those in some provincial areas on our own, and uh, Stefan will get into details. There are some programs which are joint with the federal government which would require federal uh, agreement amendments, and those take time. And the federal government has been, you know, occupied with other things 
until very recently, but I'm sure they'll get to it. There's no philosophical problem with these changes, but it takes a while. So, Stefan, why don't you take over there? Uh, Mr. Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, so just to um, provide a little more information right now uh, in terms of household income limits, uh, so for one bedroom in uh, Cape Breton Regional Municipality, it would be 28500 For two bedroom would be 35500 And uh, for three bedroom would be 48000 Last year, so uh, as the deputy uh, mentioned, um, uh, our CMHC partners are, are critical uh, when it comes to establishing household income limits for the purposes of our uh, eligibility of our programs. And so we're just waiting for new household income limits for 2022. 20, uh, uh, this will be uh, reviewed uh, at the time, but I, I'd like to point out that uh, in 2021, CMHC provided uh, household income limits that were less than uh, the the previous year, 2020. So for 2021, for a three bedroom, CMHC uh, provided an income limit of 41,000 uh, for CBRM. And so for, as a program policy, what we decided to do is, and, and we have the ability to maintain the previous higher income limit. So that's one, one way that we were able to help Otherwise, that income limit would have been reduced in 2021. So we're waiting for the new uh, household income limits for CMHC for 2022. Um, the other um, uh, piece of information that I would mention is that, uh, so the island, Cape Breton is divided into two hills. So what I mentioned was for CBRM. And then for the rest uh, of Cape Breton, uh, rural areas would apply. And so the household income limits for rural areas for one bedroom, it would be set at 47,500. For two bedrooms, would be 54,500, and for three bedroom, would be 64,000. Um, so again, we uh, this is something that we're reviewing right now over the over the, the years. CMHC uh, through a combination of formula, they establish household income limits, and then the province adopt them. So we're that's something that we're looking at for 2022. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tilly. Great. Uh, thank you for that for that answer, and, and that that is the big concern that that we hear, especially uh, in CBRM, because it, it, it's technically an urban area, but a lot of the incomes uh, there's a lot of poverty in CBRM, and the, the exact situation that uh, Deputy Lafleche talked about, uh, if you look at. Uh, out around Groves Point, right where the, the county line ends and the, the new picks up, it's opposite sides of a bridge, uh, basically where um, those income levels are different and it's, it's very difficult for people to understand. So I'm glad to hear that, that we're, we're working on that. Um, just before I hand it over to my, to my partner here, um, uh, just a quick question um, maybe for, uh, for Sean, uh, Mr. Luker. Um, around um, the biggest, I think the biggest thing that I see in my office is housing, and and I have to just to just to commend your team. Um, they have been amazing uh, to to as a new MLA with a new CA to work through um, the cases that we get on a daily basis. It's it's just uh, it's just been awesome the the coordination back and forth. So I appreciate that very much. Um, I guess my question would be around. Um, the, so we have 3,300 units, and, and I know that's a significant, as Deputy uh, said, a significant percentage of the provincial, uh, provincial number. Um, but given the fact that CBRM, over 30% of families are in poverty, so uh, I think that 30% uh, uh, number kind of jives there for us. Um, do we experience, um, from a staffing level, how, how do we, are we able to turn around vacant units quickly? Is there a large vacancy uh, piece? Is, is there a way that that could, somehow we could get more staff in there to help turn those over quicker to, to, uh, to get those units flipped faster? Mr. Luker. Thank you, uh, Mr. T Mr. Tilly. Uh, our turnaround times are variable. Uh, some are served by our own staff and then some are served by contractors. And it does go, um, sometimes the turnaround is defined by the amount of damage that would be in our units as well. So if the damage is extremely significant, which can happen, it does take a longer time to turn around because we'd have to go to contractor base and 
and the majority of the time our contractor base uh, is limited in CBRM that does unit turnarounds for public housing so our timelines do get uh, inconsistent when it goes to that level so um, we do we have staffed up over the last three years like I uh, hired a team of 12 staff to do a turnaround exercise because uh, because historically um, I saw the same type of inconsistency as well. So we addressed that with uh, doing a project on uh, hiring 12 people to do turnarounds. That was successful and it did increase our turnaround abilities. And to answer your question on our vacancy rate, uh, our vacancy rate is typically, uh, for the ones that aren't under project, we would be uh, around 2% or under is, is consistent. Uh, um, Aside from that, though, we have been yearly looking at our turnaround rates and working with contractors to come up with more accountability on timelines, too. Uh, that's a work in progress consistently. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luker. Uh, I believe it'll be Mr. Mombriquet. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we, we do 20 minutes each. So I'm just trying to get a sense. 20 of minutes per Per caucus, per caucus, yeah, yeah, yes. per caucus, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Good job. I could go 20 minutes if you really wanted me to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, asked, I was asked multiple questions last committee, I remember. I, I already got in trouble. Um, so, so listen, I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. Um, uh, to the folks from Cape Breton, I think I have a, a personal story about all of you. Mr. Mige and I went to school together, and... We'll keep some of that out of the records of government. Uh, I, 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 play, I played street hockey in front of Kent McIntyre's house as a kid. Uh, and, and listen, Sean and, and all the staff and Steve and all the staff at uh, Island Housing, you know, I'm, I'll be seven years in this in July and, and uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calls and comes to the office and uh, you have, you and your staff have responded quickly and professionally and helped a lot of families. So uh, it's always great to have the opportunity when uh, you're up here, and, and some of the some of the folks from Halifax are here to hear the the, the compliments come from the people who are actually on the ground dealing with. It. So you guys are doing a great job, um, Deputy. Good to see you. You're, you're, I always say you're, you're best when you're off script, so uh, it's 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 great it's great to see you. And I appreciate the opportunity. And, and again, uh, Mr. Richard, thank you uh, so much. So I guess my my first question is around the CBU project. So CBU, uh, that's very exciting. What's happening at CBU is absolutely amazing. I always say when I was a student there, there was 50 international students, and now there's 3,500, right? So that tells you the impact of, and how excited we were at the time to have 80 international students. We had 80 come in. We had a, a cohort of 30. We couldn't believe it. And now, there, and now there's 3,500. And, and, and they really have, it's really transformed the community. Um, I am really looking forward to the community uh, consultation because I believe you should have a conversation with Chester Borden about youth programming in that new development too as well. Um, he wants to expand. So um, it, uh, so I look forward to that. I guess uh, what, the question I have is uh, for the international students that are in the community now, uh, some come into our office and they're, they're looking at options and stuff. So that, and it, you, you, you may have talked a bit about it in the presentation, but so what are you looking at the, at the breakdown for students, for the community at large, for, for and, and the portion of them that will, would be considered under uh, Cape Breton Island housing, that threshold. So do you have that breakdown for us right now? Um, Mr. Mayetch or Mr. McIntyre, which, Mr. Mayetch. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll try to address that. So um, the income threshold, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, the students that arrive with us the first year, they have to have a guaranteed um, income provided and they have to pay their tuition up front. But come into year two, year three, year four, et cetera, um, they're on their own and they have to, so a lot of them are trying to earn, um, they're working, they're trying to sustain themselves with employment. Um, they may have the money from family for the tuition, but then the living allowances, et cetera, um, they'd be responsible for that. So um, I don't believe that we have students currently residing within the Island Housing Authority because they're a temporary resident, they're not a full-time continuing resident. Um, with this new project, we do expect it is going to be a mixed development, there's going to be affordable housing, there's going to be market units, um, but we do expect that there will be a large number of students uptake the ability to, to live in a three-bedroom apartment or a two-bedroom apartment. Um, I, I'll just make mention our residences, we do have on-campus residences, we have 424 beds available. We were at a little over 90% capacity pre-COVID. We're anticipating that will go back 
to that level. Um, but the difference that we're seeing with that older demographic of students wanting to be closer connected in the community for employment opportunities and the family issue as well. They're bringing spouses, they're bringing children. Um, you know, our, our end hope, and I think for everybody in the province, is that they'll stay. And perhaps it's through the uh, AIP, the Atlantic Immigration Program, or they'll find other opportunities. We, we want them to stay in Nova Scotia. It's nice to see them coming to Halifax. We do have a lot of students that would move to Halifax post-graduation, but again, we want them in the, the municipality. We want them in Cape Breton as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayich. Uh, Mr. Montbriquet. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank, thank you for that. Uh, uh, I just think the, the project uh, is really exciting uh, for folks that are familiar with that. That's the largest neighborhood in the Sydney area, Ashby. Um, and uh, there's a lot of history on that property, uh, for sure. Um, but to have a piece of land of that magnitude right in the middle of a neighborhood is pretty significant. And um, uh, I hope uh, that uh, it all works out, because it would be great for, for the greater Sydney area, but great for the community too as well. There's so much, as you said, there's so much development going on uh, at home right now and there's so many people to work that that uh, this would just be another project to add uh, to the success story. And the momentum that CBR I'm seeing really since amalgamation is we're, we're dealing with growth for the first time in 25 years. So it's, it's, it's really great to see. So I'll shift over to, to, to Mr. Luker. So I just, just some, some, some questions around I'll start with the the rent the rent supplements. So so are, are for the I guess my question is is how many do we have how many rent supplements do we have in the community that you have access to or on the island and and are they all being used at this point? Mr. Luker, I'd like to uh, defer to Mr. Stefan Richard because he's in charge of the rent supplement program. Mr. Richard. That's quite all right. Housing is a, is a confusing uh, world. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you for the question. So uh, at the moment, uh, we do have just uh, north of 604 rent supplement available for ho to households in, uh, uh, um, under the uh, um, Cape Breton Island um, district, uh, for like a better term. 300 of, uh, of those are portable, which means that the benefit is paid monthly directly to the household and the others would be, uh, not 245 would be non-portable. We also have homeowners uh, who can benefit from a uh, rent supplement program. Now they have to be in severe uh, housing need, which is 50% of uh, income paid uh, towards, or going towards housing costs. So we, we have just uh, 52 of, of uh, homeowners that are benefiting from rent supplements in Cape Breton. Thank you, Mr. Mombriquet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so my next question is around, and we, we all receive calls as MLAs in the offices at home about folks who uh, are looking to apply to, to get into a unit. Um, you gave some statistics around uh, how many units are in Cape Breton and the percentage as per the province. What kind of wait list are you looking at now uh, on the island? Mm. Mr. Luker. Uh, thank you. Uh, Emily Mombriquet, uh, our current wait list is around 820 range. Uh, when I started four years ago, it was approximately 860. So it fluctuates month to month, but uh, 800 is around the number I've seen consistently without much growth. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you'll have till 1047. So, Ms. MLA Tilly, or sorry, MLA Mombriquet. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And my final question before I leave a few seconds for my colleague Fred <laughs> Tilly. Um, just my, I, I, so there's been a lot of talk around Halifax and infrastructure. So there's been, which is necessary, absolutely. We, you know, we see, we're seeing the pressures all over the province, particularly here in the, in the capital. It's it's very significant. But I would also argue that it's significant in the CBRM, which is the second largest. Uh, municipality in the province. So, um, and with growth, which is great, uh, we're seeing we're seeing the pressures. Um, so, my question is, is that as you're looking at all of the infrastructure work, that uh, and the new builds that are happening in Halifax, is the government uh, and the province looking at new builds and in infrastructure? I know we're looking at projects uh, like the one at CBU, but but in public housing itself, are you looking at? Are you also looking at new infrastructure for the CBRM? Deputy Minister Lafush. So I didn't quite understand. Is that just for public housing or overall? Public housing. Emily Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. If, for for if public housing. 
Okay, well, at this, at this point in time, we haven't made any decisions on new growth in public housing anywhere. We're kind of new to it, and we're, yeah, as, uh, we're trying to uh, absorb the recommendations of the Affordable Housing Commission. Recommendation number one was on setting up a standalone Crown Corporation. Uh, so you, you may know that we sent a note to staff, uh, I did, uh, a few weeks ago, maybe two, three weeks ago, indicating that there had been some uh, approval in government to go ahead with that. That requires new legislation. Until we do that, um, which would probably be in the fall, the minister will have more to say about that, the timing, et cetera, and what it is. Until we do that, uh, we're probably not in a position to comment on whether we would have new public housing anywhere right now and uh, we haven't had new public housing outside of seniors housing ever since we've inherited the units from the federal government we have had in seniors housing uh, and there may be some non-seniors in seniors housing because of dem demand nature but generally we haven't had any so we are uh, it's a it's a big decision which government will uh, have to reflect on and we'll uh, we'll get to that shortly Thank you. Uh, MLA Tilly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess my question, my, with the one minute I, we have left on this one, um, my question will be on that wait list. Um, so what's the average? We have approximately anywhere between 8 and 8.50 on a given month. What would the average wait time be uh, for that list? I mean, I know that's going to vary whether it's a three-bedroom or a two-bedroom, but just kind of on an average... Uh, Mr. Luker. Thank you, MLA, MLA Tilly. The average wait time for public housing in Cape Breton is two and a half years. Okay. MLA Tilly. Uh, just a quick follow-up on that. So how would that compare to other regions of the province? Mr. Luker. Uh, we're about uh, six months longer on, on average compared to the province. Okay. MLA Tilly, you have a few seconds if you want to. <laughs> okay, two seconds, we'll pass it okay. over to our colleagues at the end. <laughs> MLA Coombs. Thank you, and hello. I, I'm going to pick up on the wait list. I'm wondering, do we keep track, particularly in Cape Breton, of how many, have, how many people have applied for housing but were turned down, whether because they didn't meet the threshold income levels or other reasons? And my reason for asking this question is because I have a deep concern over people who are now unable to afford to live in their homes um, and are now seeking public housing. Mr. Luker. Thank you, Emily Coombs. Um, so right now we turned down about 18.3% uh, turned down on offer of housing compared to 11.8% provincially. Emily Coombs. Wow. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we're keeping track of that. Um, I hope we're keeping track of the income levels that were, um, because I think it's very important if we're going to be looking at our income level thresholds. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. Um, my other question, it was something um, I believe you also touched on, and that is you mentioned priority housing for abuse. And I'm wondering, uh, particularly if violence was used, my question is how, is the de how are you defining abuse? Is it defined by physical, or are we also defining it now as psychological and mental abuse? Mr. Luker? Yeah, I'm, uh, Coombs. Uh, when we look at uh, priority access for applicants uh, uh, escaping domestic violence or abuse, um, we usually rely on their social worker or their caseworker that they're working with, or the uh, if they're dealing with like a halfway house or a shelter of any sorts, we usually rely on uh, the advocacy of the groups that they're working with to define what their abuse that they're going through, because that's what they usually supply with their application for the board to review. So if they do qualify that as abuse and that they would be better suited under our programs, it, that would be going towards our boards for decision. Thank you. No Thank you. MLA Coombs. Thank you again. And um, so switch it up a little bit. Um, the presentation to the CBRM Council by um, 
Dr. Catherine Levinson Reed talks about the importance of the nonprofit sector in addressing the need for affordable housing. Dr. Levinson Reed says nonprofit providers charge lower rents, make investments in community spaces, and engage in community member in planning. Um, my question is I, I'm, I'm guessing this is going to be to uh, the Deputy Minister. Um, why has there been little emphasis on the nonprofit or non market housing in the provincial government's plan? Deputy Minister LaFleche. Well, I, first of all, I'm not sure I would agree with all the suppositions of the professor, but letting that aside, um, I think uh, uh, that is not true that there has been not an emphasis. The emphasis has been growing that sector, and we've been working in collaboration with the federal government and growing that sector. In fact, the announcements in the last two weeks have been specifically for that sector. We acknowledge that we haven't had this degree of uh, house price, housing price increase or our rental pressure, uh, you know, probably uh, since I've moved here in 1994, maybe some of you can remember that in your youth, I don't know, but I don't uh, certainly remember it since 94. So um, we're, we're not, uh, we didn't develop the type of nonprofit sector they would have developed in the other major cities that I've lived with in Canada, Ottawa, Toronto, uh, Montreal, uh, they have a very, very uh, well-developed and mature nonprofit sector. We haven't had that stimulus to develop that sector. So until very recently, until the last five years. So uh, we're at the point where uh, we've got to develop the sector, we've got to help it grow, we've got to make sure it has access to financial capacity, it has to have planning capacity. And Mr. Richard's programs that he has uh, developed in concert with uh, the federal government, I think, attack that directly. So I would disagree that we don't have that in our plan. It's in fact a, one of the, the foundations, the three-legged stools of our plan is the nonprofit sector and to grow it and make it strong. Maybe I'll pass it over to Stefan to describe the individual elements. Mr. Richard. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the, for the question. Um, so one of the, uh, I mean, if, if we look at uh, the action plan under the um, bilateral agreement with the federal government under the National Housing Strategy, there's a clear commitment by government to support uh, and ensure sustainability of the community housing sector. Uh, just a few weeks ago, um, I'd like to point out that we announced almost a million dollars in grants to uh, community housing organizations under the Community Housing Capacity Building Program. And uh, five organizations in Cape Breton were recipients of, uh, of funding. Um, there was the Straight Area Housing Development Society, the Cape Breton Community Housing Association, New Dawn uh, was one uh, recipient, Joe McIsaac Housing Co-op, and of course, uh, Mr. McIntyre's group uh, to help develop housing. So, uh, so it is a critical aspect of our plan and our strategy moving forward, uh, as Deputy mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Emily Coombs. Thank you, um, and I respectfully will disagree, uh, considering that not, that affordable housing is defined by 30% mm -hmm. of the rent, um, and there is no public housing in the plan be built, um, as well as much of the discussion from the government side in the legislature had been about um, private making it easier for private developments occurring. So I do respectfully disagree on that. And Dr. Levinson Reed, her, uh, um, I think she's above reproach. Uh, she is very much respected, I'm sure, in the CBU community for her work. I know I've worked with her. She, uh, Dr. Reed, Levinson Reed also talks about the importance of affordable housing being located near services, being part of neighborhoods, being targeted to the needs of particular groups, and being truly affordable. Um, so my question is, how are these factors being considered into the housing being built? Um, particularly by the pro with money being from the province, considering many of the issues I've heard from in Cape Breton, particularly from CBRM to um, Richmond and Inverness, is that a lot of the housing is not next to what they what we always refer to as the as the F, the three Fs: fuel, food, and pharmacy, with the PH. But so. Um, Yes, my question is how many factors are, are these factors being considered when these hou housing developments are being built by the province? Mr. Richard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. 
Uh, those are all critical elements. Uh, obviously, when we make investment to support, whether it's a private developer or, or community housing uh, development group, uh, we look for our amenities, we look to um, you know, access to transportation, we look to uh, sustainability and viability of the project. This is really, uh, really critical. Um, and so those are, are all important factors. Now, we, we also know that in some communities, there's, there's a housing need, uh, but they may not have access to transportation. And it's, so it's, it's a need and then it's transportation, which comes first. Uh, so in, in those cases, we would work with community uh, members with the developer but also other community partners to ensure that uh, the project not only meet the housing needs of, of the households that will uh, benefit from from the housing but there's also access to the fuel and and the uh, the, the service of whether school or and other amenities in the, in the community thank you thank you MLA Coombs thank you um, in March uh, 20 people in in my riding of Cape Breton Center Whitney Pier were suddenly evicted from their new Waterford apartments. The building had to be vacated for multiple code violations. What role is the government playing in making sure affordable rentals are safe and properly maintained, especially when rent, the rent supplements are being used, which is government money, as well as any other government money that is being used to help um, with these rents? Mr. Richard. Thank you for the for the question. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, there are various ways we we can support, but primarily through uh, a program called Rental Wrap, and it's very difficult for uh, for a French guy to uh, to pronounce the, the the full program name, but uh, uh, Residential Rehabilitation uh, Assistance Program. Uh, this uh, this is a program uh, that provides forgivable loans to landlords to um, make sure that those affordable, uh, typically naturally occurring affordable housing, are maintained and are safe for for the longer term. So there's a there's a term of affordability that we require in return for for ensuring that those those units are are safe. Uh, in the case of emergency situations, uh, our colleagues at the Department of Community Services would work with tenants who all of a sudden find themselves. Uh, maybe without without shelter, uh, Red Cross would be involved. But uh, from a program side, this is typically how we uh, how we bring support is through uh, uh, our uh, rental assistance program. Thank you, Emily Coombs. Thank you, and yes, the the, fo the folks at DCS and Housing First were phenomenal in that situation, and I had the had the unfortunate but pleasurable uh, experience of working with them. Um, I'm wondering, so the government doesn't, so before you provide a, a rent supplement or any other assistance, there's no inspect, no one goes in to inspect that that housing, that that housing is actually up to codes and be, and does not have these types of violations before you provide that money to the landlords. Mr. Richard, or excuse me, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, maybe I'll ask Stephen Hines to. Take this one. Okay, Mr. Hines. As far as ins hi, uh, thank you for the question. As far as inspections on the rental wrap program, which uh, Stefan referred to, uh, we do inspections on those, and yes, we address every major issue, especially around fire safety, accessibility, uh, structural, plumbing, heating, electrical. Um, the big thing for us is to be able to get in and actually do the inspections. Under the rent, you asked, I believe, about the rent supplement program and if those units are inspected. Um, I would have to defer that to Stefan. I can tell you that under the original social housing agreement, it was, uh, it was part of that agreement. But again, the program has grown since then. But uh, the other thing we do is, uh, again, we provide, uh, when we do rental wrap renovations, we provide bid sheets and specs based on current code. And um, we do inspections prior when the work is being completed and funding is requested. And we ensure that when it's done at the end, it's all good. The hard part is, is that if you don't have a landlord who applies, then you can't provide that assistance. And sometimes that happens. Thank you. We'll have a couple comments uh, from Mr. Richard as well. Or, sorry. Uh, so it's handing over to MLA Hansen then. No, I got one, but you should get another one. Okay. Okay. MLA Coombs. Thank you. Um, 
So in 2016, the CBRM's Affordable Housing Homelessness Working Group, um, and I will admit right now I was a part of that, um, identified 137 people experiencing homelessness in Cape Breton Regional Municipality. By 2018, the, n the number had more than doubled uh, to 278. During the first wave of the pandemic, the province agreed to pay 50% of the cost for hand washing stations and portable toilets and laundry facilities for people experiencing homelessness in CBRM. And I'm wondering if Deputy LaFleche can answer this question. Um, have these supports been continued to be funded by the province? Deputy LaFleche. So, uh, Deputy Tawil can certainly answer those questions. She's away this week. She wasn't invited. Um, but, uh, you know, I can ask uh, maybe ADM Graves to give you a call. That is really in their uh, wheelhouse. Um, uh, they ha track all the numbers of the homeless and they do the wraparound supports. Our job is to, to work on the building side of it. Perhaps you can send that to the clerk and we can distribute it to the committee. Send what? The, the name? The name, yeah. The name, okay. Yeah. Sandy Graves. Okay. <laughs> okay, very good. I'll be very happy that she's been on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Coombs. <laughs> yeah, no, I, Sandy, 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 and I have had a few conversations, as did a few others in our depart in the DCS department. And I, I, I find it extremely concerning and strange that we have a department for housing, and it doesn't deal with homelessness. I, I find that very concerning, considering what most people are looking for who are homeless are homes. Um, so I, I, I just find that really deeply concerning that the departments uh, do not coincide with each other. Um, so I guess my other, I, one other question I have before I hand it over is, according to Stats Canada, in 2016 there were 50,000, I'm sorry, families in Nova Scotian core housing need. The same stats show that there were 5,460 households in Cape Breton in core housing need. Most of these were people who rent which would be 3,575. Core housing need is defined by, as I said before, spending 30% or more of your income each month on housing and utilities. Uh, again, for anyone who wants to answer this, how important is it, how important has the rent cap been in keeping people housed in Cape Breton? Because I know from speaking with people, their rents are so high that some of them are finding it very unmanageable. So I'm just wondering about how important the round cap has been. Deputy Minister LaFleche. We'll probably tell you in 20 years when some academic has done a study on it because frankly, you know, we're so early into the rent cap, uh, we could not, uh, you know, really answer that question to any degree of certitude. Um, and I'm not sure where the question was really going, but uh, the rent cap, basically uh, the 2% rent cap ensures that landlords cannot increase more than 2% uh, the rent. Um, we could look at other jurisdictions and see what rent caps have done there, but I cannot answer in Cape Breton what it has done in the short time it's been in effect. Thank you. Emily Coombs. Um, I'll leave it be before I before I hand it off to my colleague. I'll just say that you, you just said in your opening statements though, quote, hopefully not um, with regards to the rent increase um, hopefully not more than 2% of the 2% cap, and that's why I, that's why particularly for this question. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague from Needham. Thank you. Uh, Emily Hansen, you have until 11.07. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just want to mention that one of the issues we've been seeing across this province is uh, small affordable rental buildings being sold and the new owners doing minor renovations and jacking up the rents. An option we think the province should look at is having the first right of purchase, and we talked about this in the House, the first right to purchase properties like that when they come up on the market. Um, the government could then work with nonprofits and other community groups to manage the housing project. We've seen hotels for sale turn into housing. We know about the project in Dartmouth. Um, that's working with the Affordable Housing Association that's creating 65 housing units for those who likely are facing homelessness. Um, so my question is, how are vacant properties in Cape Breton being used to increase affordable housing options? Uh, any, okay, 
Mr. Richard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. Um, it would be hard to say, uh, to provide a general answer, how the vacant buildings in, in Cape Breton are, are being used. I can tell you that, um, you know, as a follow-up on the conversation on the community housing sector, this is an area that we're really interested in working closely with our uh, community partners to find those opportunities. So to make sure that when a property goes up for sale, uh, that a community housing group can be involved and, and can purchase uh, uh, that property and therefore maintain affordability for, for a longer period of time. Uh, so we're looking at, at different options to, uh, I know that access to financing is a, is a key barrier for community groups uh, at the moment. They're, they're struggling more so than, uh, than the private sector to access uh, financing. So, so we're looking at different options uh, on that front. We're also working very closely with the Community Housing Transformation Center, um, which is a national uh, organization. Uh, they're recently, uh, they've been involved with a housing investment with the Housing Investment Corporation to look at supporting organizations across Canada uh, who need access to to financing. So uh, we're aware that uh, you know there the, these opportunities are there. Many smaller landlords in in the province and in Cape Breton are are ready to call it quit and put their their buildings for sale. So uh, so we're looking at ways we can actually help grow our community housing sector and make sure that there are opportunities to acquire these buildings. Thank you, Emily Hansen. Well, with my one minute left, um, we were just talking about the rent cap, and I mean, maybe this is, you know, just a, a just an open question, but um, we know that uh, the rent ca uh, rent eviction ban uh, was removed on March 21st, and rent evictions have been used to get rid of tenants so that landlords can charge a higher rent to the next tenant. My question is to anyone: Have any of you seen any increase in the number of people who are unhoused since the government ended the rent eviction ban? Deputy Minister LaFleche. Uh, again, uh, th that's a very short period of time. It would be hard to know. Um, and my colleague, Sandy Graves, would be the one we would direct you to to ask that because they take care of the home, the homeless file. Uh, they have the supports to deal with homelessness. They have all of the programs to deal with the other things other than just a physical building that uh, the homeless need. They need a lot more than just being put in a home in many cases, and that Department of Community Services is the appropriate department to uh, to deal with homelessness. We work very closely Order. with them. Order. The oh. uh, time allotted for the NDP <laughs> has ended, so we will move to the Progressive Conservative Caucus, and we will begin with MLA Young. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses. My question is to Deputy LaFleche. Um, the housing crisis is happening on a global scale. It's not just Nova Scotia. It didn't happen overnight, and uh, we know it can't be solved quickly. And the Nova Scotia Affordable Housing Commission noted in 2021 report that there is a significant shortage of adequate attainable housing to meet the needs of Nova Scotians, which disproportionately affects individuals who live on low income. What is being done to address the need for attainable housing in Cape Breton? Deputy Minister LaFleche, thank you. Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, so I probably should best let Stefan answer that, but with first um, uh, acknowledging that the Affordable Housing Commission did a great service by uh, pointing out uh, uh, their recommendations, 17 in total, and uh, we, we, uh, we are working through all of them and implementing them. Some of them have already been implemented. Some are what... Uh, people want to see a box ticked and they want to say it's done. Some of them will never be done because they're ongoing recommendations. You work on them forever. So what you, you, what you the, the box ticking is actually the fact that you're working on it and you're making a pro, uh, progress towards a goal. Um, so that's one where we're always going to be working on that. We'll always be watching that. Non-affordability in the rental market in particular and in the in the um, single uh, family housing market is relatively new in Nova Scotia for most of the population. There's always some of the population considered it non-affordable, but for the vast majority of the population relative to other regions of this country, Canada, it's relatively new phenomena. It's something we haven't dealt with. They have dealt with it in other areas, 
and it's something we we've got to quickly deal with now. It's come it's come on very quickly, and if we achieve our goals that the government has to double our population by 2050, that'll be uh, you know an incredible pressure. If you think of how many units we have to build a year, and how and we have to make them affordable in an era of rising building costs, an area uh, an era of uh, uh, you know, construction costs, uh, worker uh, non-availability, we got to get more workers into the workforce. All of those things will contribute to riding prices. So how do we keep a cap on the affordable affordability of units we build? This presentation we had earlier in Tartan Downs, those types of projects are exactly where we need to go in Cape Breton. So with that, maybe I'll turn it over to Stefan and allow him to talk about some of the specific programming that we have with our partners in Ottawa that we think will allow us to keep the either the construction of new single family homes affordable or uh, the construction of rental units affordable. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the questions. Uh, so first, I, I'd like to just point out that housing is, is uh, you know, probably uh, you all know very complex, uh, and and the needs of Nova Scotians are also diverse, which is why we're working on a broad range of of solutions. Uh, and and for some people, you know, getting a monthly benefit through rent supplement is is all they need. Uh, for others, public housing is is the best uh, the best option. Um, what we're seeing uh, over the last few years increased demand. We need, supply is not keeping keeping pace, so we need to accelerate. We're, we're happy to see in, in this budget uh, there's an increase to uh, to support more development uh, of affordable housing. Uh, we're soon going to, uh, to to make some announcements on provincially owned land that will uh, unlock a lot of parcels across the province so so that developers in the community uh, housing sector can uh, can take advantage of that and build housing that is uh, that is affordable um, in 21 22 we've invested or committed uh, nearly 35 million to create 740 um, or, or just north of uh, 700 new affordable housing units and 425 rent supplements we're planning to invest and in, in create 550 new rent supplements uh, this fiscal year alone. So, so we're seeing uh, a broad range of needs, and we have a broad range of solutions as well to help Nova Scotians. So, may I Thank you, Deputy Minister Lafleche. Uh, if I can continue down that road, Stefan mentioned the, uh, the the government land for housing initiative. Um, uh, ministers alluded to the fact that we have a, a number of properties coming forward initially. We have. Uh, I think it's 100,000 properties in government, so we got to comb through them, look at them, see which ones are serviced, which ones are in urban area in demand. But that's an incredible lever that we can do because we can basically say to someone, you can have the land for whatever at a discount if you create affordable housing. An incredible lever. And the good thing is since the government announced that, that they were going that way, the municipalities are coming to us and saying, we'd like to do that. Now, right now, as you know, um, you were a municipal councillor, I believe, and as was Mr. Tag. Up, oh, as was, geez, okay, we're lining up the <laughs> municipal councillor. As was this, uh, Mr. Monoverquet. So um, uh, you cannot sell at a discounted value. So you cannot create that arrangement where you could negotiate that. So we're looking uh, very much at where we can go and allow municipalities to do that because they also have land and they would like to do that. So we're doing whatever we can to lever not only in terms of cash dollars, but in terms of maybe land and other things, that possibility. My <coughs> colleague here, CEO McIsaac, is a, a person who's been working on that for almost a decade in government now, first at Nova Scotia Lands and now with, uh, with uh, public housing. Uh, is a firm believer. He's identified the properties. We've pushed some out. We're going to have some more announcements from the minister very shortly. So th that's one of the great ways we can do it. Thank you. MLA Young, yeah, follow up? One more. And then I'll uh, pass to my colleague, MLA White. And I'll say, as a former councillor, that's something that I was pushing back, uh, you know, multiple years ago. And I think we owned a significant amount of properties for a small area. So exciting news. I'll try this one, um, Deputy LaFleche. Rural communities have different challenges when it comes to accessing attainable housing and assisting the homeless. Uh, the Housing Commission attributes this challenge to lower incomes, diverse and changing populations, and the conversion of permanent rental housing to short-term rental accommodations like Airbnb. 
What work is underway to address homelessness in Cape Breton? Mr. Richard. Thank you for the question. Uh, so while, uh, while we already mentioned that homelessness is uh, under the purview of our colleagues at the Department of Community Services, uh, I'd just like to mention that we do, on the housing side, provide some financial assistance for shelters uh, through a program called Shelter Enhancement Program. So when, uh, when shelters um, for women, children, and, and youth for example, who are experiencing um, family violence, uh, second stage housing. Um, organizations, for example, are eligible to receive some funding. Uh, so over the last five years, we, uh, we've invested in, in some Cape Breton organizations to receive assistance under the Shelter Enhancement Program. For the rest of, of when we're talking about homelessness in general, uh, as Deputy uh, Lafleche mentioned, we work very closely with uh, the Department of Community Services. So we're mostly responsible for bricks and mortar, and uh, and they're responsible for support services mainly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richard, and I'll move on to MLA White. Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe my questions are for Mr. Luker because they're really focused on Cape Breton Island housing. So, with two and a half years waiting list for people to get a, a property. Why does it take so long for properties to turn over for people who are, say, uh, with their family condition size has changed or their health conditions have changed to move them into a different unit so that it makes another unit, a bigger unit, big, available for a family? Why does it take so long, Mr. Luker? Mr. Luker. Uh, could I get some clarification on to what specifically takes so long? Because your question is addressing the wait list to get into housing, to be housed with us, but you're, you, you might be discussing a transfer option, so I just want to clarify what I'm addressing. Mm, Emily White? It is a transfer options, but I'm, I'm looking at it in the light of if it takes two and a half years for a family to get a, a, a housing unit, then why is it taking so long to move people who no longer need a two or three bedroom home and looking for a smaller unit? Mr. Luker. Thanks for the question uh, and the clarification on that. Uh, when people are, are outside of like their family composition, say their children grow up and they move away and they decide to stay with us, typically what takes place is um, we will ask them on a need basis. So when there is a need for their house specifically, that's when we usually initiate that activity. So it's not that as soon as it's their children move out that we ask them to move. It's when we have demand for that location is when we ask them to move to another location. Now, mind you, there is some uh, resistance to those situations, and sometimes they do go to residential tenancy board action to resolve. Thank you. Emily White? I would assume with a two-and-a-half-year waiting list, that need exists constantly would be my thought. If you'd care to elaborate on it. Mr. Luker. Um, without knowing the specifics of the examples that you want to go through, I, I wouldn't be able to elaborate much on to that. Emily White. Thank you. So over the holiday season, the Cape Breton Island Housing Authority was able to reduce their vacancy rate from 4% to 2.5%. Outside the holiday season, we're looking at... Uh, Cape Breton Island taking six months longer than anywhere else. Can you tell us why that is? Is there a reason why it takes six months longer in Cape Breton? Mr. Luker? I don't have a good answer for as to why. I, I just know that that's the facts that I have handed to me. Six months is a um, just the difference between Cape Breton and the rest of the province. And uh, I don't have any defining reasons as to what what would cause that? Uh, we have a larger portfolio, so. Mr. White. Thank you, and I realize that two and a half years is a long time, and from this side down, we get these calls. We are dealing with these folks who are in dire straight and dire needs, and it, I'll be honest with you, it's kind of bugging me here that I'm hearing in two and a half years to begin with but much less that that's six months longer in Cape Breton. And that's not acceptable to me. So I don't know if you want to reply. No, that's not going to work. So, uh, 
Is it Mr. Hines? Or we just need you to use Mr. Richard's uh, microphone. Just sit in the vacant chair in the end there. Sorry. <laughs> Music stops. Musical chairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then Mr. Richard can remain seated and we'll just share the uh, vacant chair. So I'm acknowledging, is it Mr. Hines or? McIsaac. McIsaac, yeah. my apologies. Mr. McIsaac. Um, is this live here? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I can try and address a few of those uh, questions. Uh, uh, Emily White, sorry for the uh, confusion there getting up here. Um, basically, with the policies and procedures we currently have in place with the Housing Authority in Cape Breton, as well as the rest of the province, um, there's some discrepancies by region, as well as by, uh, like for, for HA. So that's part of why uh, we've been instructed through, um, by government to look at the new Crown Corporation and coming up with consistent policies, procedures, and how they get applied throughout the province to, to maximize uh, benefits for the tenants as well as the uh, uh, processes we have to deal with. And when we looked at the current systems, they're different by region um, because there was five different housing authorities, each had different policies, procedures, uh, and, and we're currently going through all that. And we have three or four top priorities that we're going to be working on immediately, and one of them is on the tenant placement and vacancy processes. Um, with, with just over 12,000 units that we manage, uh, I should clarify that. So the housing authorities have approximately 10,300 units that they own, or sorry, um, have direct management of, but we also look after eight other programs for municipal fairs and housing programs that have been inherited for, as our properties are managed by the staff in these housing authorities. So. Uh, there's quite a few units when you look at those uh, differences as well as where they're located. So what we're doing now is looking at constant uh, application of pol new policies and procedures and they're all being reviewed. W one of the items where we know we have some ability to um, make some changes is on the application process, tenant placement, uh, reducing the vacancy rates. and. Um, We've gone through that. We're looking at a new policy coming forward where we will make some changes to how uh, applications are received, how, how they're processed. Right now, they're done manually, so we need to get to a digital system. We need to upgrade our IT for, for doing that with that amount of applications. Uh, we also have issues where people want to get into our units, and, and this is important to understand. They may want to get into their units at some point, and we do it by chronological order. So they, they may say, well, I want to move out of my home in two or three years, so they'll put their name on the list. Um, and our current process means we have to contact them first if they've been on the list for two or three years, and they have up to three refusals, and uh, they could say no, no, and no, and we have to go through that. So we think that should change. We think we should have more of a pro-weighted system if you can move Instantly, you get a, a factor, and not just chronological order. We also are looking at, instead of having three refusals, moving it to one or two, and that at the end of that, you get off the list. And you have to apply maybe six months later. It's going to make a huge difference in the vacancy and placement process, as well as we're going to be given very strict timelines for responses on a refusal um, right now. It ranges between 24 hours to two weeks, depending on what JJ you're dealing with. And that's the policies that they have in place. So we're gonna come up with a more consistent application, not just for Cape Breton, for, but for the province in general. An another major issue we're facing right now as far as extending the, the time frame for tenant placement is the influx of funding we're receiving from the federal government for uh, upgrades. Um, the, the funding, where there's green fund accessibility, there's more and more uh, work being done by the HAs to improve the conditions of these facilities, which means renovations are in place, some, some significant, which delays the time frame for getting the work done and the tenants back in. So we're, we're looking at the whole thing as, as a lump sum, and, and we have several new policies we're looking at bringing forward uh, with the new Crown Corporation. Thank you. Thank you. 
And Emily White. Thank you. I appreciate the answer, and I'm happy to hear you guys are checking into it and, and trying to create a change because that's certainly not acceptable from anybody on this side. I'm sure as, as well as you guys, I know. So switching gears a little bit, uh, I, I believe in your presentation you said that 64% of the public units are seniors, I believe it was. So I want to know, in, in Cape Breton and Housing Authority, what role do you take on for responsibility for seniors when it's an emergency situation? What, what is your role in relation to an emergency situation? For example, when the power goes out. <laughs> Deputy, Deputy, Deputy Minister LaFleche. So, uh, there was an emergency situation recently in, uh, in mainland Nova, northern Nova Scotia. Cape Breton is eastern. Um, it always takes me a while to figure that out. But northern Nova Scotia, and um, we didn't know, Steve and I, what role we played. Um, but we suddenly got a phone call from the mayor of, uh, of the county. And uh, he was out at a unit where uh, the power had gone down and the emergency backup generator wasn't working. Uh, it, it, in fact, it hadn't worked in a long time and there was one on order which hadn't arrived in a long time. Um, so uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we sprung into action um, and asked the mayor if he had a generator of his own. And he sure did, so he brought his own down. It was a gas one, not propane. So it eventually ran out of gas, and then there was nobody to service it. So um, we, uh, he went back and filled it up with gas, and uh, we learned a few lessons from that. We're new in the game here, OK? <laughs> we, we learned we have to, uh, and, and the generator only served the common areas. It didn't serve the, the actual units, and that's the way it is. Some have generators, some don't. The policy is different everywhere. Uh, and Steve's looking into that now. Um, anyway, um, uh, what we learned was that, uh, thank God we have some great mayors and councillors in Nova Scotia. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, do you want to uh, talk about uh, what we're doing on these emergency things? Uh, you, uh, Mr. McIsaac, you have uh, one minute uh, to. Okay, um, thank you for the question. Um, I, I'm a numbers guy. Uh, engineering. As a result of this incident, we did some analysis. We have 397 generators within the HAs, all different shapes, sizes. Um, we've decided to look at centralizing those uh, backup power systems to certain facilities and, provide, and upgrading the uh, power requirements. But at the same time, trying to get tenants that require that into those facilities order. moving forward. Uh, sorry, Mr. McIsaac, order. Uh, the time period for the uh, PC caucus has ended, and we will go into the lightning round. We have about five minutes per caucus. Um, MLA Tilly. <laughs> Lightning. Lightning. <laughs> I've, never heard, I've, never heard, I've never heard an accountant be That's lightning. Okay. Yeah, we, I get to start the lightning round. Perfect. Uh, chartered accountants. Lightning. Yeah. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, panel, or uh, witnesses, I should say, for your, uh, for your great answers. Um, I think my question uh, is going to be around the idea of of uh, the housing sort of committee. So we know that um, a committee has been established for HRM to uh, help with the housing uh, crisis that they're facing here. And, and knowing that um, we're in a similar or maybe even a worse position in, in CBR, I'm just wondering um, why a, 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 a committee or a task force wasn't set up to look after the issues in CBRM as well. Deputy Minister LaFleche. Okay, um, I'm not sure if, uh, which side of that issue the mayor would be on. Uh, I know you've seen that the mayor in Halifax was not, uh, and the councillors were not initially very receptive of the committee. So uh, it was set up in Halifax because that's where we identified and, and various uh, private consulting firms and, uh, and other industry associates identified the huge backlog. They sort of fell behind about five years ago when uh, the ramp up in population in Halifax occurred, um, which is just occurring now in other areas, so I'll get to that. And um, they fell behind on, and uh, their system worked perfectly well until we had this rapid population increase. And uh, some of the issues identified in Halifax were very unique, 
regarding how they, they treated planning, the center plan, the regional plan, and the way they were implementing it. Um, and the amount of uh, points along the plan where things could get caught and not go anywhere. Um, so uh, stuck is the best word. So um, one of the things that was developed was the concept that the, the minister would have to intervene. This is not new. It also exists in several other provinces uh, for some of the big cities. And Halifax is a big city. It's the only big city in Nova Scotia that makes the cut in the national big city. Um, so we, uh, we decided we would uh, create a task force which would unstick uh, some of the issues we're having, which were great for Halifax when there was no growth. But as soon as growth hit, they were not responsive enough. Um, the councillors would have a different story, and I respect that. Um, and uh, so it was a unique thing for Halifax. In other areas of the province, and I'm not saying CBRM right now, we have different issues. In other areas of the province, I'd go to and they'd say, well, our issue is not our planning regime. In far, ours is 100 times as fast as Halifax. Our issue is that Halifax stole our business building inspectors by paying more. And we don't have any building inspectors now. And, um, you know, or whatever. It's very different issues. Or we do not have enough uh, scale in our municipal unit to hire the planning department we need. Okay, so those are very different issues than Halifax. The situation in Halifax is quite unique. I'm sure if uh, Mayor McDougall came to Minister Lohr and said, we desperately want what Halifax wants, um, the minister would reflect very seriously and see uh, if it's possible in Cape Breton. Um, but we'd also look and say, does Cape Breton have this, those same issues as Halifax in terms of the stuck planning? and the consultations that go on a very, very, very long time. Um, and I think we'd probably say no. And I think you'd see from the gentleman here that they would probably say no also. They're not facing the problem that developers were facing in, in Halifax. So that's why it's different. Not to say we wouldn't have it. So this spring we introduced another, a number of charter amendments and all the, of you, the nine of you were there in the legislature for HRM. They asked for them. They were somewhat controversial in some quarters. They asked for them, though, and we delivered them to them. I remember Mayor McDougall saying, geez, I'd love to have some of those. She didn't know what they were yet. Um, now that she um, knows what they are, they were introduced, we'll have that conversation on whether she'll want them. And we always offered them to everybody else for the fall legislature. But it, Halifax said, yes, we want them, and they have the charter. So we could do it easily, Order. only affecting them. Uh, the five minutes for the uh, uh, Liberal have ended, and we will move on to the NDP caucus and MLA Coombs. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Deputy Minister, with uh, the waiting list of two and a half years and the high number of people looking for housing in Cape Breton, why isn't there a plan to build public housing for these provincial lands that were mentioned instead of giving them to the private developers? Uh, Deputy Minister LaFleche. We haven't announced the provincial lands uh, specifically yet, and as I said, there are 100,000 properties, so the provincial lands are, are somewhat uh, fantastic in magnitude, but the first batch will, we, we will announce uh, will be the low-hanging fruit, the ones with service, the ones in the popular areas, the ones where, you know, uh, we can be near schools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at, at this point, uh, we haven't announced we're not building public housing either. So none of those things have been announced yet, and anything's possible. We're looking at what the best, uh, the best possibilities are. But we do know um, uh, that uh, the quickest way to get things going, where there is a lack of housing, is to put these lands out to the private sector right now. It could also be community nonprofits. Um, so uh, there's all sorts of possibilities that come, come forward and Stefan has programs and we will work with community nonprofits. I think in several counties we've already been approached by community nonprofits on these lands. So you'll see some of that too. So it's not just the private sector. Thank you. Uh, MLA Hansen. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to hear that because that was one of the pieces of the question I was going to ask. But I'm just going to go back to the rent cap. Um, if the department doesn't know what the impact has been and doesn't seem interested in finding out the impact of the rent cap, how will the, you as the deputy minister be advising the government when it comes time to decide if the rent cap will be removed or temporarily staying on? 
Deputy Minister LaFleche. Well, I can't remember the exact date, but we have somewhere around 18, 20 months to go until the rent cap is up. And and we didn't say we weren't interested in finding out. We said we don't know yet. I mean, it's it's so soon, it's hard to see the long-term effect of a rent cap. There are studies on the long-term effect of rent caps in other provinces, and they reveal basically an imbalance with uh, a lot of uh, residential single residential family units built, a lot of condos built, and very few rental apartments built. So we do know that empirical evidence in other jurisdictions is that the wonderful situation in Nova Scotia, where until recently you had a dominance of rental units, rental apartments, to condos, um, uh, the empirical evidence is that that would be reversed if we kept a long-term rent cap. And that's consistent across cities in North America. Um, we've... Uh, we feel, and uh, and uh, we uh, people have commented to us that we have a wonderful situation because of the ratio of apartments to condos in Nova Scotia, and we have the dream. So we wouldn't like to lose the dream due to the rent cap. On the other hand, the rent cap does deliver value to a certain segment of the population. So all of those factors, pros and cons, would go in a recommendation from my staff here uh, to the government. Uh, when the time comes to look at the rent cap. Emily Hansen. Thank you very much for that. And I just want to just say that maybe um, this particular government can look at the NDP legislation on the rent control and the, on the rent cap. And it actually has a, a clearer uh, picture of what that will look like for tenants and as well for landlords. But um, I, I just want to make a, um, a point. Did you have a question? Okay, I just wanted to make a point um, just because we, we talk about affordability, and I mentioned this before um, in, in in this particular room, that, um, you know, our, our rates are, are looking like they're horrible. Our vacancy rates for public housing is, is, is you know, 2% and, and similar market housing. So that says a lot about what people can afford and how expensive it is to live right now. And um, I just want to say when we talk about affordability, it, it's great to look at the market, but we need to look at what's happening now when it comes to being able to afford things and rent gear to income, which is 30% because no one should never be paying 50% of their income in order to, to live, um, should be exempt. Uh, more so when it comes to these new builds because when we talk about affordability, affordability for those right now, especially what's going on, needs to be examined with the 30 percent. Thank you. Thank you. you guys. We will move over to the PC caucus and uh, I recognize MLA Taggart. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if I could, I'm going to ask uh, my, uh, put my question to Deputy LaFleche. And, uh, uh, Deputy, Deputy LaFleche, so what progress has been made to implement the re recommendations of the Affordable Housing Commission? Uh, we did uh, release a report card, uh, I think in December, was it? Or June? Uh, I don't have them all in front of me, but would you like me to go down them one by one? Or? Well, just uh, like an update. You know, oh, sorry, okay. Emily. <laughs> or excuse, excuse me, sorry. Deputy LaFleche. Okay. Um, just tell me what tab it's in there, buddy, and uh, so I can get to it. it. I just looked at it a minute ago. It's in one of these tabs. Here it is, 4D. Yeah. Right 4D. Okay. So... Number one, uh, we talked about is in progress, arm's length uh, corporation. Uh, number two uh, is already done. The minister has addressed that, I think, in the legislature. Uh, number three, uh, I think that was introduced in the fall uh, in, uh, in the first part of it. In the legislature and passed, that's in effect right now. Now that the, uh, uh, the rent eviction ban has come off due to the COVID or loosening, um, the MGA, the HRM Charter, uh, those were announced as under review. We're in the review period right now. Um, and that's something we're never, you're always going to be reforming the Charter and the MGA. I mean, that's, you know, but we're going to do what we can now to get early things done. Number four, um, long-term housing strategy. Um, we're working on that. You've seen the, 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 early, the early version of that in terms of what we released in the fall. Again, there's, the strategy is a living document. Um, 
So number five, I spoke to earlier uh, in a, in response to the question, I think, of uh, Mr. Young, and um, and I was trying to address uh, Mr. Tilly's question there when we were uh, at end of time. And number five, so what's happening there um, is that uh, the whatever we offer at HRM is available to the other municipalities, except there are 48 of them we got to cater to, and sometimes one or two of them don't like. Uh, like, for instance, there was one in particular that didn't like um, the, um, uh, what, 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 in the fall, inclusionary zone and objected to everybody else getting it. So you got to deal with that, right? And we have to deal with that in a process because there are so many of them. With HRM, there's a one charter. And I know that Mayor McDougal would like a charter, so that's another option. So, um, so we're working on that. Um, number six, again. It's something we're working on with the $35 million announcement. You never stop working on it, uh, but we got a good start to it. Um, number seven. Uh, number seven is a difficult one. Uh, we do the provincially owned land inventory, and that can help. But, you know, costs for materials and labor are going up. There's a lot of inflation. So we've got to constantly be on the lookout for number seven, or we'll be chasing, you know, around in a circle and never get anywhere. So number seven, again, we're going to have to keep working on. Uh, number eight, we've done a little bit about that, and we talked here about um, there's some initiatives that the government is doing through other departments here in the construction trade sector. Um, so number eight is underway. Number nine. Now, number nine means different things to different people. Um, and um, so we do have the new lending programs, but we're always going to have renewal. And renewal is good for the environment. When you take down, someone referred to uh, an older building with, you know, six units. Sometimes you take those down and you put in a modern building with ten units. You're now housing ten people. Uh, if you can achieve the same affordability with much less GHG, uh, released because you have modern, economically viable units uh, which uh, meet uh, all of the modern standards. They're also usually more accessible because they have to be built with new accessibility code, etc. So it's not always bad to take down old units. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Um, we're building the community ca capacity, 11, 10, we talked about that. <coughs> Public housing transformed, we talked about that. 12. Expand housing options. I think we've got a lot of housing options, and we're looking forward to our housing meeting at the end of June with the federal minister Hussein. Uh, minister Lohr will be going, where we'll hear all about the great new federal initiatives. And I'm not being sarcastic, okay? Um, there are a lot of great new federal initiatives. We just got to see how we can access them. So, you know, um, uh, hopefully there'll be a broad array. 13. Um, 13, um, this is one where. Um, we, um, we've got to work closely with our colleagues. Dwayne Provo, um, the uh, ADM, of, uh, Associate Deputy Minister, Office of African Nova Scotia where Affairs, is working closely with us in this area, as well as Justin Houston, the Deputy Minister of El New Affairs. So we have to collaborate with them. They know the communities. They know how it works. And uh, we can easily get into the wrong zone if we don't know what we're doing there. So we are working with Duane. We're working with Tywalk. We're working with uh, Acoma. Uh, you've got a lot of, but we want to work through the proper channels there. Um, number 14, um, those legislative amendments went through. I've only got three left. <laughs> 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 I would, <laughs> you were so close. Uh, I would ask that. <laughs> order, uh, perhaps uh, you can circulate uh, to the clerk, Deputy LaFleche, the uh, update on the, on the report. Please and thank you. <laughs> okay, so at this point, if we have any closing remarks, uh, and if we don't, we will move into committee business. Uh, does anyone have any remarks? Uh, I do have closing remarks. Short, <laughs> short and sweet, Deputy <laughs> LaFleche. I want to say that uh, what we've been unable to maybe stress enough today is how closely we work with the partners. Uh, community services is, is our core partner. Yesterday I made a presentation to the Deputy Minister's Committee and we've got six different departments working with us, the Office of Regulatory Affairs, Community Services, 
Um, we've got uh, uh, communities, culture, tour, uh, uh, tourism, and heritage. Uh, and we've got Service Nova Scotia, et cetera, all working with African Nova Scotian Affairs. So we do work with all of our partner departments to create successful solutions, and each one of them has legislative pieces that you have seen in the legislature. But I also want to talk about um, the great relationship with Halifax Regional Municipality. You hear several councillors uh, talking about this and that and not being happy. But I've got to say, we have a wonderful relationship with the mayor and the team uh, under Jacques Dubay, the CAO, uh, Kelly Denty, and, uh, and uh, the other staff who have worked very closely with us. Uh, all of them are experts in what they do. They want things to be untangled. They want to move forward and provide solutions. And uh, we're looking forward to having a similar relationship with the staff in Cape Breton. I think, um, you know, I've known uh, Marie for many, many years and uh, also her sister who works there. And um, we know the deputy CAO, he is in fact chair, I think he's president of the Association of Municipal Administrators. Um, and, and we will be seeing uh, all of them uh, tomorrow night at the uh, Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities meeting. Looks like we'll be seeing you too, Mambo. Mm -hmm. So that's good. <laughs> oh, it's Kendra, okay. The last, when I first met Kendra, was it was in the okay. lobster lineup in Yarmouth uh, for, the, uh, for the, the same meeting. And with that, I want to thank everybody and we'll leave. <laughs> thank you, Deputy Minister LaFleche. And you guys are, as, as he said, able to leave and we're gonna conduct our committee business. Um, was there any, I guess, my apologies, any other closing remarks? No, oh, okay. Seriously. <laughs> We'll call a couple minutes recess while the witnesses uh, get their things together.
order. Order. We will now move on to the committee business. Um, we do have a piece of correspondence up for discussion. I received from the Face of Poverty Consultation. Um, anyone have comments on what we would like to do that? Um, we, not, we can acknowledge it uh, or perhaps move it forward to our next agenda setting topic if we so wish. Um, Emily Taggart. Thanks. Uh, it's my opinion that it should go. Uh, uh, we'll soon be moving on to our next uh, six topics and uh, we can all consider it. And if, if one of us want to put that forward, uh, then it'll come forward. If not, you know, there may be other pressing issues. But I, I think that's the way we've proceeded with other, uh, other um, um, you know, uh, uh, re requests. Uh, so I think that would be fair. Uh, but that, that's just my opinion. But yeah, thanks. Thank you, Emily Taggart. Is there any other discussions on uh, the correspondence? If not, then we will uh, move to. Uh, I don't believe. I don't no, we we are in agreement. Um, so then, every, that concludes committee business for today. Uh, just a reminder that our next meeting is June seventh, two thousand twenty-two, at ten a.m. till noon. Uh, Department of the witnesses is the Department of Com Community Services East and East Preston Family Resource Center regarding early childhood intervention to provide support for families who have children with disabilities. And if there's no other committee business, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.